We're continuing in week two, and I want to thank Pastor Sammy for preaching last week on, on how uh, the darkness cannot overcome the light and, and the power of Jesus' birth. And this year we've been in the Gospel of John and, and looking through it, and so we're taking the Christmas story from the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John takes a, a different approach, and it's not the, the focus on the wise men or the stable or the angels, but it's this imagery of who Jesus was as the gift of God sent into the world. And it shows us that he is the word and the life and the light. And he uses these three words to talk about the effect that Jesus had in coming into the world. And today we're going to talk about a, a message called a witness to that light. A witness to the light. And uh, beliefs come through a, a variety of different ways. Many times when we're growing up, our beliefs are formed by what we're told. And sometimes you realize that as kids, maybe someone, your parent or someone told you something that you ended up finding out later in life was not true. Uh, in Reader's Digest, there was some things that people wrote that they used to believe as kids, and I want to share a couple of them with you today. It says, I believe that if I ate a watermelon seed, a watermelon would grow in my stomach. <laughs> Caused panic for that person. Uh, I believe that people in the past lived in a black and white world because old pictures were only in black and white. I believe that all teachers lived at school. I thought they slept in the classrooms and never went to the bathroom, ever. If you ever had that shocking experience of running into your teacher outside of school, you're like, oh, they exist outside of the classroom? Uh, this person believed that lightning came from a flash of a huge camera in the sky. So every time they saw lightning, they would smile real big. <laughs> this person believed that white cows made white milk and brown cows made chocolate milk. <laughs> this person believed that if the ice cream truck was playing music, it meant that it was out of ice cream. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> we got a, a confession in our household. My wife called that truck the music man. The music man's in town. We didn't tell them that the music man had ice cream. And so once our girls experienced that there was ice cream with the music man, it changed their belief system. Uh, this person believed that if they ate a lot of carrots, they'd be able to see in the dark. Because those carrots were good for their eyes. And then last one, and this one made me laugh as a father. I believed that instead of an Easter bunny, there was an Easter pig. I went to school and told my class. I will never forgive my dad for telling me that. <laughs> and many of our beliefs at young ages are formed by what we're told. But as we grow and have experiences, our beliefs are shaped uh, not only by what we've been told, by what we experience, what we witness, what we walk through, through our education, through our life experience. And it begins to form the beliefs of who we are. And beliefs are important, and the Gospel of John here was written, and he gave his purpose at the end. He says, I've written this book so that you might believe, and that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing he's the Messiah, you may have life in his name. And, and so as we've been going throughout this year, our goal has been that you would learn and experience more of who Jesus is by seeing the stories and the teachings and the miracles that you begin to deepen your belief. And by deepening your belief, you believe that he's Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And that as the Savior, you would begin to experience new life in his name. And the big idea for today's message is this. The light of Jesus brings hope to a weary world. Friends, we live in a weary world. People are worked up. They're worn out, they're weary, and they're on edge. I mean, we went to uh, Snowflake Lane, and, and it was an amazing experience, and people were laughing and ooing and aahing and taking pictures. And then just a few minutes later, in the Bell Square parking garage, attitudes changed. Horns were honking. People were not letting others in. And all of a sudden, the joy and beauty of Christmas turned to chaos. There was crying kids in cars and in different places. And it's like, oh, that didn't last long. You see, we live in a world then that gets worked up. It's on edge. It's ready to give up. But Jesus came into a world that was weary. He was born at a time when the Israelites, the Jewish people, God's chosen people, were weary from Roman oppression 
from difficulty of life, from disappointment, and they were looking for a savior. When we look again, Jesus is coming back to a world that's full of strife and wars and rumors of wars, that the world continues to be weary, yet in this weariness, there is hope, there is relief. And that's in this person named Jesus who was sent to the earth to be the word and to be life and light for all who will believe. And so in John chapter 1, we pick up the story here in verse 6. It says this, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now this can be a little bit confusing because we're in the gospel of John. And John the author was one of the disciples of Jesus. And he's writing this as an eyewitness testimony. But when he mentions the name John, he's not talking about himself. When he speaks of himself in the gospel of John, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But when he talks about John, he's actually talking about John the Baptist. And so all throughout the Gospel of John, when you see the name John, he's not referring to himself, but rather John the Baptist. And so he's speaking of John the Baptist in verse 7. He says, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those, born, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. We see here in the Gospel of John that he's making an emphasis. And and we see throughout this letter in, in the beginning here that he's using this imagery. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light came to the darkness, but the darkness did not perceive it, did not overcome it. And we see these imageries, and then it's almost abrupt. It's almost then a jarring. It says there came, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And so we see in the beginning, as he's depicting this, this person of Jesus, the gift of God, he's emphasizing who Jesus is, is, and then he introduces us to the role that we play, to the role that humanity plays, because John is very human. John was Jesus' cousin, and John would stand out. In the, he was a man that lived in the wilderness. He ate locusts and honey, has a little bit of a wild nature. If he showed up to Life Center Rainier today, he'd be wearing flannel. Um, you know, he would be, uh, he'd be real, real, probably have a beard, longer hair. And, but he stood out in the desert, and he proclaimed repentance and to be baptized. And then there was a day that Jesus was coming, and John declares, Behold. This is the Messiah whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. And he spent his life proclaiming about the good news of Jesus up until the point he was martyred. He was killed for his faith in the Messiah. And we're introduced to this role almost in this abrupt, subtle way that interjects in this story because next week we're going to pick up and it goes on to talk about the purpose of Jesus But it's a reminder to us that in the story of God, God chooses humanity to play an important role. And it's this, the word and the life and the light are spread through the world by the witness of human beings. I mean, you think, how do we get our scriptures? Our scriptures are divinely inspired by God. But he chose people, men and women, to write these holy scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us a witness and testimony to who Jesus is. Jesus, when he came to this earth, he gathered up his disciples and he began teaching them. And he says, wait for the Holy Spirit who will infill you. And then I'm going to go away, but the Holy Spirit is going to come. And then you are going to be my witnesses to the rest of the world. Jesus' time on earth here was short. But the impact he's had through his witnesses has been immense as it's spread to millions and millions of people around this world. And life and light would seem to exist on their own. 
Jesus being light and life would seem to exist on their own. But this verse makes it clear. The message of Jesus would spread through humans, through broken vessels that have been enlightened by the love of God, that they believe in Jesus Christ and they choose to live in such a way that their lives are illuminated by the new birth they've experienced and they share this light and life with others. In John 20, 31, we see that these things are written that you might believe. Who wrote them? John, a man sent by God. And he introduced us to another man who was also sent by God named John. And maybe even a better description for John the Baptist would be John the Witness. And even in the book of John, he's mentioned 14 times here. And it's always talking about his witness and what he was sharing. Humans who bear witness to Christ with words will be the means that everyone comes to faith in this world. Why am I here preaching today? Because I'm here to bear witness of the goodness of God. Why are you sent out each week? Because you are sent out to bear witness of the goodness of God, that your life would be illuminated with the truth of who God is. And as you walk into a world that's dark, and oh dear Lord, the Pacific Northwest is so dark. I mean, it's hard for my three-year-old to understand right now why it's dark at four o'clock. Daddy, it's dark. Is it bedtime? No, it's not even dinner time yet. And it's dark. But yet we live in one of the darkest, the spiritually darkest places in our nation. Where people are not just ignorant about the truth of God. But they are opposed to God. They are angry at God. They're angry at his church and people who call on his name. But yet we are called in this moment and God has placed you here in Pierce County, in Spanaway, the shrub stealing capital of the world. (laughs) If you're new here, we'll, we'll fill you in on that later. But to be a life that's illuminated for him. And that everywhere you go, you would share the light of Christ. And that's why we send you each week to be a witness, to be an ambassador for him. Because God is using Life Center. He's using the other churches in this region to make an impact for his kingdom. And if we don't do it, who will? If we don't live with the truth of this gospel, then who will? Because God's plan has not been to have divine revelation with each person, a one-on-one encounter where he comes down from heaven, reveals himself. His plan is to illuminate the lives of non-believers who become believers and they begin to live as a testimony of the wonder, power, working God in this world. And he uses you and me. And so his plan is to light up millions of lights in this world. Millions of lights. The word and the life and the light, they came into the world. But they're not going to conquer darkness like a bolt of lightning brightens the night. They're going to conquer it by lighting millions of cold, dead human lives with the oxygen of the gospel that began to breathe life, that began to illuminate and have spontaneous combustion because of new life in Jesus. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And this doesn't make me great. It makes him great. Imagine giving a tour of your home and you were to walk in a room and you were to flip on the light switch And you're like, first, I want you to see the light enter the room. People would think you're weird. (laughs) When light is displayed, people can perceive it. But yet the gospel introduces the light because human hearts cannot always perceive the light that's present. They have to be made aware and be made known that it is present. We live in the advantage that we have light instantaneously. I mean, we flip on a switch, and in this room, hundreds of lights come on. We have trees from Costco 
that we can pull out of our attic. We can set up in 30 seconds and plug in and all of a sudden our living rooms are lit up. Praise God. I fought that fight for years of the natural Christmas tree. Uh, my wife finally convinced me and I'm never going back. We have the instantaneous moment of where my three-year-old says, do you want the fire on, Daddy? Yes. And she walks over to the wall and turns on the fireplace. I mean, think of what it used to take to make a fire in the home. And so, my brother, can I get away with this? Someone has chopped a lot of wood in their life right there. You know, it's, it's the instantaneous nature that we have that we've become so accustomed that we miss what this really meant in this time. I mean, light was hard to come by. And when it got dark, it was really dark. And so the imagery of this, the, the reality of this would have hit home. And in our world, in our lives, we're so used to ambient light. And there's, we can't even see the stars because we live in a populated area with light pollution. But they would look up to the heavens and they would see the light. They would see the star shining in heaven and they would see it surrounded by darkness. And what God wants each and every one of us to do is in a dark world be sent out to, send, to shine like stars in heaven. That people would perceive the light of the gospel. But the challenge is a witness is only as good as their credibility. If you've ever watched a court TV show or even real life proceedings, what they'll do is they'll look at the character of the witness. The character of the witness matters, doesn't it? And too many times the church has lacked the character to be God's witness in culture. We've lacked the character to testify and be believable because our lives don't look much different than the lives of those that are around us. And God calls his people to a high standard. It's called a standard of holiness, a standard of righteousness, a standard to be set apart. And there's, there's a blessing and a danger in that. The blessing is, is that we get to show and be an example to the world of what God can do with someone's life. The danger in it is religion can bring a lot of pride. And God can do something in you that sometimes causes you to look down on those he has not done it in yet. And that's why we must make much of Christ and less of ourselves. John, in, in, in John chapter 3, would say it this way, I must decrease so that he can increase. I want to just let you know, this will never be called Tyler Schaefer's church. Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about his church. And it's called Life Center because we are called to bring life in Jesus to every life in our communities. That's our heartbeat. That's our mission. And that's why we exist. And in a world of celebrity culture and even television ministry, too many times we've propped up people that then didn't have the character for the position and witness they had. And when faults and failures have come along, it's, it's brought less credibility to Jesus' church. Do you know that you have an impact everywhere you go? That the life you live, the way you treat people, the things you say, they're not evidence just of you. They're evidence of God inside of you. And if you call yourself a believer of Jesus Christ, you now carry the ambassador title. You now carry the witness title. And you no longer are your own. You're his. You've been bought with a price. And so that means my reactions and my responses and my words are not a reflection of who I was. It's a reflection now of who he is in me. And so when I get angry or frustrated and things want to come out, I'm reminded that God is greater in me. And so the things that should come out aren't the things of my flesh, but they should be things from his spirit who dwells inside of me. And we have no excuse to lose our credibility in this world because when we lose our credibility, it's not that people stop believing in you, it's that people stop believing in him. And eternity hangs in the balance. There is a real heaven and there is a real hell. And each of us will have to make a life-defining decision. 
But before that, I just want to remind you that the words of a witness come from a heart that's convinced. Are you convinced that Jesus is hope for a weary world? Are you convinced that Jesus is hope for your weary world? There's some things I'm convinced of. There are 42 new Hallmark Christmas movies coming out this season. What that means is there's 42 new titles all with the same plot. I'm convinced that Coke is better than Pepsi. I'm convinced that the Sonics will return. I'm convinced that the Mariners will be stuck in mediocrity in 2024. I'm convinced that dogs are better pets than cats. I'm convinced that politics cannot save America. And I'm convinced that Life Center Rainier is placed in Pierce County to be the hope of Jesus for this region. John the witness and John the disciple were convinced that Jesus was the Savior of the world. And we have to be convinced in our hearts and lives if we are going to be a witness for him. We are convinced that he is the hope and answer at all times and through all times and for all things. Because every person will make a life-defining decision about Jesus. Each of us have to. We have to make a life-defining decision about Jesus, who he is, whether we believe in him, whether he was the Savior, and what you believe about Jesus determines everything else. If you believe he was just a good teacher, a moral person, a prophet on earth, then his words just become suggestions. They just become wisdom. But if you believe he was God's one and only son sent onto this earth to pay the penalty for your sin, to live the life you could not pay, to pay the price that you did owe but you would never be able to, and to receive the free gift of salvation which you did not deserve or can never earn but is yours freely, that changes everything. And you have to make a life-defining decision about who Jesus is. And once you make that decision, you don't get to sit back and say, I'm good. I'm saved. Heaven's my own. When you make that decision, it's a decision to receive him and then a decision to follow him and then a decision to let him illuminate who he is through you. That you become this vessel that he shines through to tell the world that there is a Savior who loves them. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the great Christian thinkers of the 20th century, he was born in Germany in 1904. He was coming of age as a scholar, teacher, and pastor when Hitler rose to power. Early on, he recognized the great evil of the Nazi ruler, and Bonhoeffer struggled with the role a Christian should play in a country being led into a path of destruction by a government whose cruelty seemed endless. At the height of World War II, Bonhoeffer joined a resistance movement, and he was arrested for helping a group of Jews escape to Switzerland. Later, he was implicated in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. After two years in various prisons and concentration camps, he was marched down a flight of steps and with a handful of other resistance members executed. His execution took place just four weeks before the fall of the Nazi regime. But while Bonhoeffer was in prison, he wrote letters to his families and close friends. And in one particular sobering letter, He described his decision to join the resistance. He understood that even if they were successful, his life would never be the same. And he said this, this one decision changed my life. And each of us face a moment in our life or in our journey where one decision changes everything. One decision whether Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior changes the direction of your life. And it's followed by other decisions, but identifying who Jesus is and whether you're going to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I want to distinguish something. Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with you, but your personal relationship is not a private relationship. And that's important to understand. Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with you, but there's no such thing as a private Christian. Because Jesus wants to illuminate our lives so that we declare who he is publicly. So that we profess who he is in the goodness of God. 
We do it in love and we do it with kindness and we do it in subtle ways, but we do it so that the light and the hope of Jesus shines forth in a weary world. Pastor, what if I'm rejected? Most of us, we fail to share who Jesus is because we're fearful of being rejected. Well, you will be rejected. Why? Because Jesus was rejected. In verse 10, it says, he, he was in the world and the world was created through him Yet the world did not recognize him. His creation didn't even recognize the creator. In verse 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. And so if the creation, if Jesus, who was a part of creation, came into the world and his creation did not recognize him, they did not believe he was the Messiah, and it was the Jews who were adamant on him being crucified, God's chosen holy people who he came to live amongst as the promised Messiah, and they were chanting, crucify him, crucify him. If you expect to live for Jesus and not experience rejection, you're in a fantasy world. Not everyone that I've shared Jesus with has been like, oh, I've been waiting for this day, Pastor. I am so glad you came to me and shared the hope. Some people are like, you're crazy. That's nonsense. And I keep continuing to try to live my life in a way that shows the truth of who Jesus is, but not everyone will respond to his truth. But just because not everyone doesn't, doesn't mean that there won't be some that will. And I can tell you the sum are worth those that reject you. Jesus was willing to come knowing that he would be despised and rejected by men. But in verse 12 here, it says, But to all who did receive him, to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. To be children of God. And that's the message that we have. For those that choose to believe in Jesus, to believe in his name, God gives them the right to become children of God. And belief allows you to receive adoption. Pastor, what does it take to become a child of God? It means to believe in who Jesus was. To believe that he was the Messiah, the one sent from God to take the the wrath of the sins of the world. That he went to the cross and he died for your sins. And that by going to the cross, he paid the penalty for your sin. And that you can ask for forgiveness from him, knowing that the price has already been paid and grace is yours. And that grace covers not a little bit of your sin. It covers all your sin. It removes it as far as the east is from the west. It casts it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. You are chosen and dearly loved in his sight. It allows you to become his child but it's nothing you could earn or deserve because God has done the work to make you his own. God has done the work to make you his own. In verse 13, it says, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. I mean, God adopts you into his family. You don't naturally get into heaven. It's not if you're Well, I'm human. God created me. I'll get into heaven. No, it's not of natural descent. It says it's not of human will. You can't will yourself to heaven. You can't be moral enough to get to heaven. It's not the will of the flesh or even the will of men. You can't hope for a family member to get into heaven. You can't want it for someone that would earn it. It's only by God. Our new birth is a gift from God, and that new birth is a gift of salvation for each and every person. But the crazy thing is, is that God chooses to use his people as the messengers. And we've got to become better messengers. Messengers that are less about our opinions and more about his love. Messengers that are more about, less about the worldly politics and more about kingdom principles. Of becoming servants to the least of these. Pastor Jeff, who was on our team, spoke something a couple years ago. And he says, "The, the way you know you've become a servant is when someone treats you like a servant and you're not mad about it. I was like, I don't like that, Pastor Jeff. That kind of hurts. Because I like the idea of being a servant. 
I don't like being treated like a servant. And what God was saying, Tyler, there's more of you that needs to die. There's more of you that needs to go away. And in each of our lives, there's more of us that has to decrease. We must crucify our flesh daily and pick up our cross and follow him. The gospel is not about a life of comfort, but it's a life of hope for a dreary world. We live in the Pacific Northwest. We went swimming yesterday at the YMCA. And as we're walking out, my daughter's like, Daddy, it's raining. I'm like, get used to it. <laughs> She's like, I want sunshine. June's coming, baby. <laughs> what do I know? I'm setting the, the expectations for the outward condition. Friends, family. Living in the Pacific Northwest is a spiritual fight. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritually dark place. But we don't wage war as humans wage war. Scripture tells us if it has flesh and blood, it's not our enemy. If it has flesh and blood, it's our mission field. And so people are our mission field, and we exist to come to church to glorify God for the truth of, the, of his word, to, to liven up and brighten our, our souls. And as we go out, there's like, wow, there's light. There's light. In a spiritually dry land, be a fresh drink of water. In a spiritually dark world, be the light of hope. That soul is not discouraged, but hope is bursting forth like a living stream flowing out to overflow. I'm about to go back to an old message right now. But to overflow. And as you go out, may your eyes be opened. May you see those who he whose heads are downcast. May you see those who are discouraged. And may God continue to use his people to declare his goodness. Amen. Well, Pastor, I don't have a great testimony. If Jesus lives in you, you have a great testimony. Too many times we look at the past of people and we compare our past where God says, look towards your future together. We've all been saved from death. And here's what I know. One death-defying experience is not better than another death-defying experience. It's new life in Jesus. And so we are a church full of different paths to relate to different people in this community, but we're full with the same future and the same hope and the same light of Jesus shining forth. And so every week, I'm trying to relight that flame in your heart to not let it be extinguished. And that's why it's important that we gather or gather online because this world will try to suck the oxygen out of your soul. It'll give you doubts and fears and try to cause you to believe things that aren't true about God even once you've made that life-defining decision. But we gather regularly and we encourage one another like a fire, coals needing to be stoked to blow sweetly on them so that the flame might burst forth. May the Holy Spirit breathe on your life today. And may you be illuminated for Him. Church, would you stand with me today?